So as you might guess, I love sex actually quite a bit. Uh, I think it's amazing, and as a field of study, it is truly endlessly fascinating. And looking around tonight, I think a great many of you are probably pretty fascinated with sex as well. I mean, you guys, it can create life. And I mean, that is an alone pretty spectacular, but it also is capable of bestowing indescribable physical and emotional pleasure. I mean, this is a big deal. But I'm not just interested in sex, you know, the things that we do together. I'm also interested in sexualities, our ways of thinking about ourselves and other people as sexual and romantic creatures. Further, I spent a lot of time studying sexual health, you know, our general wellness in the context of sex. And my research is involved with drawing connections across and between those three things, which are, as you probably could imagine, pretty closely related. The more time I spend trying to do that, draw connections, the more I become absolutely convinced that we have, well, a pretty messed up relationship with sex. You guys, it is messed up. But I want to be clear here. I'm not talking about my relationship with sex or your relationship with sex, ma'am, or even yours, vice chancellor. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure our relationship with sex is beautifully complex. Tonight, I want us to get thinking about the big picture stuff, the way in which our society, our societies, I should say, as organized groups of people, struggle to engage with sex as a social concept. And every society around the world and back through time has struggled with it in one way or another. To me, the inherent tension is sex, of sex is part of what makes it so spectacular. But when we struggle with it collectively, socially, there can be very real negative consequences. OK, so what am I even talking about here? It's really useful to think about sex in kind of like styles of engagement of our societies. And there are really three things that we do primarily. The first thing our society does with sex is we pathologize it. We become fixated on the things that can go wrong. Things can definitely go wrong with sex. I mean, I'm a sexual health researcher. I spend time thinking about risk. You know, there's infection. There's a whole list of things that can go wrong. But that is only one part of what sex is. And when we focus on risk to the exclusion of all else, we don't prepare ourselves for what sex is actually like. And this, in turn, can compound the likelihood of those very risks taking place. The second thing that our societies do with sex is we obsess over it. Man, do we love sex. I mean, we go bonkers for it. And if, you're, if you doubt this, just flip open Instagram now or open a magazine. I mean, media of all stripes are absolutely overrun by sexual content. I actually don't mind that. I love a sexy picture on my Instagram on the bus to the university every morning. The problem isn't sexual storytelling. That is actually very important. The problem is our representations of sex are very rarely accurate, and they are at worst dishonest. So those dishonest representations become even more troublesome when you think of them as a primary source of information about sex for a great many people. People learn about sex through the media they consume. So if we are being inaccurate or dishonest, we are causing some real problems. And the third thing, and this is probably to me the most troubling, the most problematic, is we try to control sex. We love trying to control sex. Rules and regulations about it absolutely abound in our societies. I'm not suggesting that sex should be devoid of some form of social order. I mean, I really appreciate, for example, that no one I can see right now is having sex. And if you are, I, I also appreciate that you're being very discreet. <laughs> it's not about no order. But I want to be really clear here. Control of sex is not about our social welfare. It's about controlling people. Usually, this is sold to us as some form of moralism. But the reality is that in capitalistic societies, controlling sex is about sustaining population growth through narrowly defined family units. It also has the handy benefit of creating social others against which we can project our angst, social enemies that we can hate, pity, and fear. The real challenge with that, and you may be thinking, OK, he's totally gone off on a mad conspiracy theory now. But the real challenge with that is even among the well-meaning, control of sex basically never works the way you think it's going to. More often than not, it produces harm rather than good. It does virtually nothing to change sexual practice or identity or behavior. 
And as I said, it marginalizes segments of our population. And if I sound pessimistic here, it's because history is clear. It is absolutely littered with examples of our failed attempts to control sex. You've heard the expression, life finds a way. Well, sex certainly finds a way. It has, and it will continue to. It will not be shackled by any government or church. If we're going to be pragmatic about this, we need to work with our sexual natures and not against them. So behind me is a photo I took a few years ago of the wall here in Sydney. And you may have heard of the wall. It's in Darlinghurst. And for decades, this was a major site of sex work in Sydney. Uh, today, I don't think any sex work goes on there. The only hustling is from maybe that one sad city of Sydney parking meter. Yeah. But it remains a pretty consistent symbol of sex work in this country. For me, sex work really beautifully captures these three, three ideas, pathology, obsession, and control. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to have any conversation about sex work that isn't focused on the things that can go wrong. And uh, you know, I confess up, I research sex work, and I'm often focused on the things that can go wrong. And there are risks inherent in sex work, just like there are risks inherent in all of our jobs. But we miss out on the things that sex work can do that are good for people. And I can assure you there are things that it does that are good. A lot of my research and the research of my colleagues finds that, for example, people who hire sex workers are a diverse group of men and women who can find certain emotional and sexual needs met through sex work. On the other side of things, uh, sex workers can find highly flexible, relatively high-paying employment. This isn't, of course, everyone's experience with sex work. As I said, things can go wrong. But it's the experience of a great many people. And truly, we never talk about that. We create a really unbalanced picture about what's going on. It's dishonest. We then build that unbalanced portrayal into our media, into our obsession with sex work. And you could probably name dozens of movies, song, hundreds of movies, songs, books, poems, television shows that have sex work involved in some way. But you know what? They're also boringly consistent in the stereotypes they reproduce about sex work, which is usually you know, a drug-addled sex worker in need of saving and a predatory lonely client preying on, a, on an unsuspecting sex worker. We know the data are clear. This is not the lived experience of most people. We need to be honest about what's really going on. And when it comes to control, sex work is the best example I can think of of society's struggle to control sex. It has endured almost every form of legal and social control you could imagine. Now, somewhat tellingly, the rationale for those control tend to change with every generation. So in the early 20th century, it was about ensuring military readiness. And then in the 50s and 60s, it was, about, uh, it was all wrapped up in emerging feminist theories. And in the 80s and 90s, it was uh, panic, and, and genuine concern about HIV and AIDS. Today, control of sex work is sold to us as a way to address human trafficking. We have so much data on this. Human trafficking represents a small minority of sex working experiences around the world, and at even a much, much smaller proportion of sex working experiences here in Australia. Now, I don't say this to diminish human trafficking as an issue. It is very important and troubling. But it is sold to us, it is purposefully conflated with sex work as a mechanism by which we can exert control. We absolutely must resist that. And to me, what is so troubling and annoying about this is that if you really want to do something about human trafficking, you decriminalize sex work. Because when people feel comfortable and safe coming forward with the things that they see, that really undermines the human traffickers. So, you know, there's a mutability of rationale here, and to me that reveals the end game of control is not some grand social ideal, it is control for control's sake. Sex work is only one example, truly. Like, I was thinking about what should I talk about? I could pick sexual education. I mean, the list goes on. We struggle in these three patterned ways when it comes to sex. And make no mistake, many of the ills that we associate with sex are both fostered and sustained by our struggle to engage with it as a society. We can do better. We have to do better. Because a society that values things like sexual freedom, sexual diversity, and even sexual pleasure, this is a society that is safer, healthier, and happier. Thank you, and I hope you have some wonderful sex this weekend. <laughs>